The common debate is a mess. There are skeptics who use arguments that are absolutely stupid. There are warmists that use arguments that are equally stupid. The whole debate has got mixed up with a lot of other things and has ceased to be purely scientific. It's got mixed up with conservation issues or anything you know. And some people who couldn't give a brass razu about climate are happy to use some of the climate activists to help them, like the farmers in Queensland, wanting them to come out and stop fracking on their land. A totally separate issue. So the whole thing is a mess. We have to calm down. We have to be real scientists. We have to talk to each other. 400 years ago, science was in a similar sort of mess. It was starting to develop. But in the late 1500s, trying to be a scientist was a little bit difficult. Catholic theology had embraced Aristotelian philosophy. The earth was made of earth, air, fire and water. And there was a lot of other issues about creationism or whatever. And an Italian prince, Federico Sisi, decided to start a scientific academy, the Academy of the Lynxes. The symbol was amazing. A lynx was supposed to be the animal with the most acute eyesight. And so the whole idea of this academy was a scientist had to describe what he saw. Not what other people thought he should see, not what theology said he should see, or philosophy. He had to describe what he saw. So this first talk today is a little bit, bit more about seeing. The Academy of the Lynxes, by the way, stopped operating a little bit after Caesar's death. Galileo, of course, was a member. There are apocryphal stories about people refusing to look down his telescope at the moon. The Academy was revived in the 1800s uh, by Pope Pius IX. Uh, it then morphed into the Italian Academy of Science and it morphed again in the 30s to the Pontifical Academy of Science in Rome. Anyhow, what do we, what are scientists saying that they see for the future? The future is the Anthropocene. We are now the climate makers. If we keep going the way we are going, with the increased greenhouse gases, the world is going to be a mess. Temperatures are going to rise to drastic proportions a scorched earth. There's going to be incredible flooding, incredible rise of sea level, more severe storms. You've heard it all. Will Stephan, every time there's a storm in Australia, this is a sign of climate change. And what are some of these scientists saying? Every country's got these prophets. To be quite honest, they are not helping the debate in one way or another. In the same way, on the other side, there are also some doomdayists. I mean, Tim Flannery said that Perth would be a wasteland by now. The Sydney dams would be empty. Hanson said that New York would be flooded by 2010. Peter Waddles in Cambridge. All the Arctic ice would be gone by now and probably does go every time there's a really warm period. Wadhams at one stage said that three climate scientists in England died because they'd been murdered by the oil industry. He's an absolute fruitcake. And any event that happens now is said to fulfil these so-called predictions. Hurricane Sandy, climate change. The latest floods in northern New South Wales. I'm a Queenslander. <coughs> And when I can remember as a kid, all those floods in North London, year after year, close I copped it then, and they've been copying it again recently. A Victorian bushfire will be a sign of climate change. Well, as the polar cold front or high system retreats a bit with global warming, 
uh, the, the lows will be hitting Victoria less, and there will be a, a change in uh, rainfall, and some of your bushfires will increase. But who says what the reasons for that is, other than it is, there has been global warming. Even a coal sack now has been turned around to be global warming. Professor Hubert Land was the uh, founder of the Climate Research Institute in East Anglia, which now has linked with the British government, Hadley Centre, and uh, it is the leading research unit in England on climate. Land wrote a book on storms in the Middle Ages, particularly in that coal period from 1300 uh, on to about 1800. He was of the opinion that storms in cold periods were worse. In other words, if the world got colder, the storms would be worse because the thermal gradient between the polar area and the tropics was more severe. And that caused more turbulence. But he didn't have enough statistics to prove it. But in 1363, the great drowning in Denmark, the ocean went in, 15 k's, villages wiped out, 25,000 dead. The All Saints storm, 1570, 100,000 people dead. Then the great storm in 1703 blew ships up the Thames, 700 ships, thrashed up the Thames. The, end of the western end of the Thames was a mess of wood. 10,000 British sailors died at sea. The best record we've got, though, statistically, comes from China. China always surprises. Some of the coastal... Uh, uh, government entities, or whatever you call them, like in China, kept records of typhoons. One of them, every typhoon for 900 years. The worst period in the Little Ice Age, when the English were sometimes skating on the Thames in winter, 1660 to 1680, and 1850 to 1880. But not today. But anyhow, look, let's forget our biases, what we think we should see, what does the data say? This is a graph from the American Climate Center of all hurricanes hitting Florida since 1850. During that time, CO2 has gone up 40%. The graph I've got is from data from the, from the NASA Goddard Space Center and the data itself from about uh, 1950 is from the carbon dioxide monitoring station at Mauna Loa in Hawaii. So that, that is objective data. No one in the world will disagree with that. The challenge is, if you say that storms are getting worse, does that data say that? This is US tornadoes in the last 60 odd years. The worst year, 1974. Where is the correlation? If you were looking at it with your eyes, you might say it's got a bit less. In Australia, the data from 1970, as a matter of fact, some people think there's been a slight drop in cyclones hitting my lovely state of Queensland. Professor Farquhar, I had a lovely coffee and I had two meetings with him, a lovely man, won the Prime Minister's Award for Science in 2015, an expert on how plants exchange water vapour and carbon dioxide in their leaves. He's very interested in wind and evaporation because that affects the water loss of plants. His research showed that winds have been dropping in Australia for 30 years. And as he said to me, I'm not strictly a climate scientist, but how but the models aren't saying that. They're saying the opposite. So, are we going to belong to this Academy of the Lynxes and have the guts to describe what we see? Or are we going to make up stories on our own various biases? And if you say, oh, that was frequency but not severity, there has been a record since 1970 of the highest winds in the tropics, northern and southern, for the, since 1970, every six hours. Again, if you lived on where I've got my little red pointer, 
you could say truth, quite truthfully, gosh, storms have been getting worse. But that would be only true for six years. Where is the trend? I'm sorry, I can't see it. And I challenge you to find it. Aren't we mixing up population trends with climate and weather? Florida, 1900, half a million people, 1960, 6 million today, 23 million. Obviously, at any storm, the stacks will damage. The Gold Coast, my grandfather bought a house at Southport in 1946, which was our holiday house for many years, coming from Toowoomba, for 400 pounds. In those days, 45,000 people from Southport all the way to the New South Wales border at Tweed Heads. Today there's half a million people in that corridor. So let's forget storms. Let's have a look at sea level. The story you're getting is that sea level is accelerating and obviously as the world warms, there's no doubt about that, there's no doubt about climate change, the ocean expands slightly, some glaciers melt, they retreat, and sea level rises. This is what some people are seeing. The Potsdam Institute of Climate Impacts that's uh, advising Angela Merkel and funded by the German government, 400 scientists at the institute, imagine what it costs, run by Hans Joachim Schellenhuber, an absolute catastrophist. There are seven tipping points that's going to wreck the world. They are predicting sea level rise this century up to two metres. The IPC average, they have various scenarios, is around 80 centimetres. The tide gauges are showing a steady rise, 15, maybe to 20 centimetres a century. Now, the main data for tide gauges, if we go back 50, 100, 150 years, are tide gauges. And when they were put in, people weren't worried about the climate debate. The tide gauge was to help ships coming in out, out of the harbour and, and the timing of, of ships, but particularly in shallow harbours. But some of those records are exceedingly accurate and exceedingly good. If you want a database of tide gauges, type into Google, say, Fremantle, Fort Denison, Auckland, and tide gauge ID and it will give you a number. Then go to this site in Liverpool in England and you will get that history. Thousands of tide gauges, you can look at them yourself. The record everywhere is that they are going up, the, tide, the sea level is rising in a steady rate, not like a skateboarder's ramp accelerating. In 92, the Americans decided they would put up a satellite system also to measure sea level. Topex, Poseidon, Jason 1, Jason 2, and the last satellite to go up to replace those previously was Jason 3. The accuracy per, per run is only two centimetres um, over a century. That's a two metre error. But they hoped by a lot of iterations they would get their accuracy down. And what does the NASA satellite system show? It shows that sea level is now accelerating at twice the rate of the tide gauges. Now that's a pretty frightening clash. Who's right? We always think, well, at the moment, we're so technologically uh, you know, biased, and we would presume the satellite is a bit better. In 2000, <coughs> sorry, in 2011, the US Army Corps of Engineers analysed tide gauges throughout the world. They got all the data from the Australian CSIRO from down here. They had European data, American data. Now that Army Corps of Engineers, not just a few engineers other than John, uh, it's got an annual budget of $1.5 billion. It is a huge body uh, of engineers. When they looked at all the tide gauges, they said, there's a problem with the satellite. The altimetry is out. There are indications that the satellite data is showing a double rate of increase and, and really overcorrected. 
They said it has serious design flaws. When that came out, people thought, oh, these guys are climate sceptics. There's a few tight gauges from the Liverpool database. Some of them look different. It depends on whether the data's averaged over so many months or over weeks or whatever. But none of it's curving upwards. In 2012, the head satellite design engineer for NASA in Pasadena, California, who has corresponded with me by email, came out and said the satellite system has serious problems. And we have now designed a system called GRASP, Geodetic Reference Antenna in Space, and we want to put that up because the clash between our satellite and tide gauges is real and we have altimetry problems. That submission was given to the US Congress and unfortunately they still haven't got the funds to do it. That is a, a schematic thing on the internet where they're advertising their system called GRASP. 2014, two doctors uh, science uh, in, from Caltech again came out and said, look, Tapex Poseidon weren't too bad in terms of analysing uh, agreeing with tight gauges, but the Jason series, uh, we call them jumping frogs, are way to blaze out. And the trouble is that when NASA designs a satellite system, they don't run it. They give a contract to a university, and the University of Colorado is running these satellites. On their website, you will find nothing about the fact that their system could be inaccurate. It is amazing that it's true. Sorry. Now, how has the International Panel of Climate Change dealt with this? I've had a good look at all their meetings. Uh, the first one, 1990, Professor Warwick was chairman from the University of East Anglia, and Professor Erlman from Utrecht, and go on and on. 2001, John Church from the CSIR was chairman. All those early meetings, they looked at the history of the last century, no acceleration of sea level from the tide gauge data. They all said that. <coughs> in 2007, with Professor Bindock from Tasmania as the chairman of the IPC Sea Level Committee, they said, oh, the satellite is showing twice the uh, rate of the tide gauges. Our models are showing acceleration. We must choose the satellite. The satellites are agreeing with the models. How bizarre is that? Would Bindoff really belong to the Academy of the Lynxes? So, looking at that graph there, you can see the steady as you go sea level rise, it is rising, and then the jump, the sudden jump, as if nature's going to do that so suddenly in the 90s when you put up a satellite. And Ford Denison. I've had great fun with this because I'm advising the Shoalhaven City Council. Uh, Senator Nara, and they were using the uh, satellite, and then I had a meeting with council, and then Mary King, the chief scientist of uh, New South Wales, allowed councils to decide to take tide gauges rather than the satellite, which they did. The trouble is, if you look at Port Denison, one of the best kept tide gauges in the world, the Australian Tidal Council said it's never been over 9 centimetres 100 years. The National Oceanographic and Ad uh, Atmospheric Administration of the US looked at the data, the same. Uh, they said it was a bit lower. Notice here, the Manly Hydraulic Lab, which is New South Wales government, the last 20 years has dropped, it's decelerating. Whitehead consultants, when they did this report for the Shell they, they admitted the same. And the US Army Corps said that the CSIRA data showed that in recent years sea level is decelerating. Does the CSIRA tell you that? No. But the crazy thing is that the coastal engineers advising councils, they don't want to be seen as skeptics. Gosh, they don't want to use the Fort Denison, and Fort Denison agrees with Dunedin and Auckland. They want to follow the satellite. 
So they use a thing they call linear fit, and they switch Fort Denison by nearly 400% up to 33 centimetres a century sea level rise rate. Now, I don't care what size of the climate debate you guys are on. That's art of deception. If you're in the business world, that would be called very serious. That would be taken very seriously indeed. So the IPC and the CSR are still using these satellites. And I ask you, and it's difficult, you are not, a lot of you are not experts on climate. Yeah. You can't be expected to be, but if you were elected to a coastal council, how the hell would you handle this? Would you turn the whole council into a climate debate? 